Bringing it hard and ha fast. <laughs> Dave Davidson of Revocation and Gargoyle. Dave, how you doing? I'm doing good, man. How about yourself? Real good. I'm hanging in there. Now, uh, obviously, I alluded, or already spoke that Dave is from Revocation. He's got a new band that's starting to take off, Gargoyle. Uh, among other things you're doing currently through the pandemic and the quarantine, what, what have you got going on uh, personally beyond the bands that you got going on to keep busy? Sure. So uh, I launched my website while in quarantine, DaveDavidsonGuitar.com. Uh, spent a bunch of time working on that, sort of compiling different materials. So uh, that's a place where you can go to, you know, read my bio, check out the gear that I use, but also uh, reach out to me directly for guitar lessons. Um, and I also have like lesson packs available uh, for purchase, so you can like download if you want to like work on stuff while you're stuck inside. And are you uh, doing also like available one-on-one -on -one stuff like Skype or? Exactly. Yeah. So you can reach out to do Skype lessons through my, my website uh, as well. There's like a direct like form to contact me. Cool. Well, and uh, I know that Gargoyle had start catching a buzz prior to the pandemic. And I didn't know how that got disrupted. Is the album still on track to come out in 2020? Yeah. Yeah. October 9th, I believe, is the, the date for that. And how would you, uh, for anyone that's not familiar yet and hasn't taken a chance to listen to any of the songs that are available, how would you differentiate that from your main project or, I guess, long-standing project, uh, Revocation? Sure. Um, it's definitely a different animal. Uh, I feel like, you know, with, with Revocation, that's more of like the death metal, progressive death metal, thrash side of my playing, um, whereas... Gargoyle is more like prog rock, so there's there's no screaming in that band. It's all singing. Um, it's just like a different set of influences, and it allows me to kind of scratch a different itch. Gotcha. And uh, while we're talking about beasts and animals, let's talk about the animal that's in your hands, your signature uh, Jackson. Yeah, this is the, the warrior right here, um, the WR7 mahogany uh, stain. Uh, it's a, it's a soup or sorry walnut stain mahogany body. Um, yeah, I, I love this guitar. Um, I've been playing it for you know, ever since it premiered at Nam. Um, I think it just looks super slick with that 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 burgundy stain and the black hardware. Um, it's got the piranha inlays. It's got the ebony fingerboard. I love that they they matched the the headstock with the body. I think it looks just really sleek. Uh, there's like a continuity there. Uh, neck through construction, uh, so it's super sturdy. Um, it's got the the push pull knob here, uh, which is cool to get different sounds. Uh, my Demarzio Signature Imperium pickup set, and of course the uh, the Floyd Rose. Now I know that you've had a a few years with Jackson in terms of the Warrior being your signature model. What is different on this one? Is it just the colors, or is there anything else different on this 2020 model? Sure. So um, uh, on the year previous, we did the custom shop run. So that was, uh, you know, an, 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 a roasted ash body with a um, roasted maple fingerboard. So on this model, uh, we went back to the ebony fingerboard. I think the, uh, you know, the, the tone of that ebony just really matches the color of the stain really well. Mm -hmm. um, that was sort of the main difference what was was the, the, the aesthetic change um you know other than you know like, i guess the ebony fingerboard you know some people like maple as far as like a sound goes and um you know some people prefer ebony um i on my very first uh signature model that was when we really worked out like all like the details you know moving knobs around like making sure the neck was perfect uh you know working with demars you know, to get my pickups just right for the guitar but since we sort of dialed in all those factors um i haven't really felt that much of a need to change uh you know i love the way the guitar feels love how it plays um so yeah it's 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 more about 
just changing up the look ever so slightly, uh, you know, every year or sometimes in a big way. I mean, I think like this one compared to the very first model with that charcoal black stain is definitely like a different look just with with uh, with the color of the stain. So, uh, you know, I think it's cool to have different like aesthetic choices and, and just to, to mix it up. Uh, color-wise every year. You mentioned that the mahogany is a new feature, the body versus the higher-end higher, higher end, uh, custom shop with the ash. What do you notice uh, tonally that this one differs from the first one you did? Um, you know, tonally, I don't know if it's got like too much of a change. I mean, like I think mahogany sometimes is like maybe a little bit of like a, a darker sound to, to my ear, whereas like ash might be like a little bit more punchier, a little bit brighter. Um, but you know, again, it's like, it's pretty subtle differences. I mean, between the pickups and the amp and pedals that you're using. And then certainly if you're recording in the studio, you've got, you know, just a whole bunch of stuff like in the box that you can do to like tweak sounds around. So, um, you know, I can get this guitar sounding, you know, very close to the, to the Ash model, uh, you know, with, with some tweaking and, and EQing, um, obviously, the uh, you know the, the 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 being one piece of ash versus like mahogany like you know a very figured piece of ash that's where your like price point's gonna be much higher because you're using like a much more like exotic piece of wood um, you know that's you know just harder to source and whatnot and and then the roasting process that adds like another sort of dimension to it as well obviously with the craftsmanship there um, but yeah they they both sound great um, I think this guitar is like an excellent guitar for the for the price point um and the you know the, the custom shop run i mean those are obviously you know master built so those are real works of art as well why i got two questions for you and they both will start with why uh why move the controls and then um why the warrior what what made you go with that body shape sure so uh i mean with the controls for those of you that aren't aware of the the, the regular layout on a, on a traditional Warrior, um, the volume knob is where the pickup selector is, and the pickup selector is in the middle. After just years of touring and playing live, um, you know, have, like I, I like to go back and forth between the bridge and the neck live for like solos and stuff like that, and then and then you know go on the bridge for for more like riffs uh, or even sometimes clean parts. You know, I'll do on the neck to give a little bit of a different um, you know texture, a little bit warmer sound. So I wanted to put that pickup selector in a place where I could easily grab it. Um, I, I, I found that playing live, you know, sometimes putting it in the middle, you know, my hand might catch like the volume knob uh, and, you know, maybe like turn it down ever so slightly. And you're like kind of messing around with your sound. Like, oh, why does it sound like a little bit different all of a sudden? It's like, oh, I like I bumped the volume knob by accident. So moving it to uh, where the volume knob was just I think just makes it for like a much easier access. Um, so that's the, the reasoning behind the knobs. It was, uh, it definitely wasn't aesthetic. It was more like functional, but I think it looks, you know, cool too, to have like the two, um, you know, the tone and volume knob together and then the, um, pickup selector separate. Mm -hmm. As far as the, why the warrior, uh, I just think the guitar looks badass. Uh, I remember seeing, um, one of my favorite guitar players, Damon Grain play it. Um, he plays in Voivod now, but he was in a band called Martyr back then. And I was just really enamored with the look of the guitar. Um, it's, it's got these cool edges, and uh, but it's sleek at the same time. I don't know. It's just like the Ferrari of guitars or something like that. And then putting, you know, different types of stains on it, I think adds like a classiness to it at the same time. Um, so it's not just like, for me, like an extreme. I mean, it's an extreme metal shape, but I think when you when you put different, uh, you know, combinations of like natural wood tones, uh, it just gives it like a different vibe. So yeah, I'm very proud that this is my signature right here. And didn't you start, wasn't it one of your first electrics? I, I want to say you were either given it to or it was a gift from a family member or a parent. Wasn't a, a warrior? I, I, I think I've, I said it mistakenly it was pink, but it was in a different, like a Ferrari red. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, my, my first warrior ever was a graduation present um, for my parents. Um, they got me a Ferrari red warrior, which I still have to the States, a six string. Um, I love that guitar. Something about the Ferrari red color that's just so cool um, and, 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 you know, fitting of, of the Warrior. So uh, I definitely still love to play that guitar from, from time to time. Um, but, yeah, primarily I've been using the, the WR7s just because, you know, with, with Revo we're tuning down low. And, um, you know, we've been using seven strings on, like, our past, like, several records. So we'll talk about the pickups because it has your, you know, signature DiMarzio. And so it's a big thumbprint of the recipe of the guitar. But... Uh, was there anything else that was really something that you were a stickler for? Was it um, maybe 
I know the shape obviously can't change too much, but uh, neck profile, was that something that you were really? Oh, yeah. Uh, I worked, you know, really closely with, with Jackson, making sure they, uh, they got the, the neck dialed in just right. Um, you know, Mike Shannon was, you know, building the first uh, custom shop runs uh, from my very first signature model, and he just, like, really nailed the neck profile. Um, it just... It fits perfectly in my hand, and I've gotten a lot of comments from people that have played it just saying like how smooth it is and, and how comfortable it is. And it also has uh, sort of like I think like a polyurethane finish, so it, it, it feels like almost like a gunstock oil style finish where it's like has that like raw, like natural wood feel. So, you know, you sweat into that, you feel it like over the years, like I don't know, I just feel like you, you, you kind of make it your own in, in a little bit of a different way than. Uh, like a gloss sort of style neck, so I've I've really prefer the the uh, that natural finish necks over the years, and um, I'm stoked that uh, they were able to just nail the profile and the feel of it. It's like exactly like what I'm looking for. Right on. So let's now let's talk about the Demarzio Imperiums. Um, I know before you got your signature set that you were a user of the D activators. Now, how does that fit in line with what you have currently with your signature profile? Sure. So. Uh, uh, the deactivators de are like very high output pickups. I was using those for a little bit. I've tried actually a whole bunch of different pickups uh, through DiMarzio. Uh, we went with more of like a medium output pickup for these. You know, with, with, with high output pickups, you're going to be slamming the front of the amp like very hard. Whereas with medium output pickups, I mean, the EVH that I use has more gain than like I'll ever need. And, you know, I'll, I'll use like an overdrive pedal sometimes too, like out front just to kind of like, uh, you know, tighten up the articulation. So it's got more like juice than, than I'll need. Um, so what I was looking for was something that was going to be like really punchy, uh, you know, really clear, something that I could play, you know, heavy uh, chords on, uh, stuff with open strings where, you know, everything would ring out and, and almost like a piano, like each note would have its own kind of sonic space like have its own voice and just the way that they um you know dial these pickups in they're they're just perfect for for what i use them for it kind of I'm, I'm sure this is either intended or unintended is because of how you incorporate such big chords and, uh, and unique shapes from your jazz background into the band and the stuff that you play i'm sure that it was a sticking point wanting to hear all those things because if you're going to do it and have such a, a unique voice within the metal world or death metal world you, you want to hear that uh, technicality. For sure, for sure. Dave, can we just hear the sound? Sure. As you can hear, they're super beefy, super heavy, punchy, uh, but really articulate as well. You know, when I'm, when I'm playing those low strings, all the notes are ringing out. And if I'm doing like open strings along with it, like just the way those like harmonics ring out, um, I don't know, I just find it even like playing like super ugly, you know, gross chords. It's just like really pleasing sound to, uh, <laughs> to my ear. I think like all the notes just like ring out like clear as a bell. So that was really what I was looking for because obviously in Revocation, um, you know, and in Gargoyle, you know, I'm trying to keep it heavy, but also, you know, push the boundaries of, uh, you know, metal or rock and, and try to incorporate these different sounds. So having like the right tools so that I can get the sound in my head out there so everyone else can, uh, you know, hear it clearly like I'm envisioning it. Uh, that was the biggest, uh, you know, point that I wanted to make sure DiMarzio nailed and, you know, they just really knocked it out of the park with these. Sure. All right, Dave, like maybe you show us some like clean tones with the split coil. Sure, so this is uh, using both pickups with the coil tap. Like if I had my eyes closed, I would have loved to hear that how that sounded, but seeing visually seeing a warrior seven string warrior play and hear sound like that is a uh, it's kind of a mind trip <laughs> yeah yeah like i said it's 
it's cool to get different sounds out of a guitar like this, um, you know, just for, for inspirational purposes and just, you know, kind of messing around when I'm like practicing because, uh, you know, you never know what like what you're going to come up with and maybe like one sound like leads you in this like new direction and you end up coming up with something that you never would have you know, written before just by virtue of like what you're hearing. Totally. And so maybe this is a good point to shift gears completely and see a different side of Dave with a different guitar. Cause I know that you have a, a, a 335, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to show that thing off. So yeah, this is my, this is one of my babies right here. It's a Gibson 1969 335. I picked this up from the, the fine folks at Chicago music exchange. Uh, I love going to that, uh, that music shop. I mean, I'm just like a kid in a candy store. There was just so much awesome gear. And I was in the market for more of a jazz style guitar. And this one just like really caught my eye. Uh, I actually did a shootout with like a couple different 335s. So I played like a 67, I think, and then a 69. And, you know, in the collector's market, obviously, the older the guitar is, uh, you know, like the more sort of valuable it is or whatever. But for me, it's all about, you know, the playability because I'm not looking for like a museum piece, um, even though this thing actually is in like really like immaculate condition. It just looks so good. Yeah, it looks beautiful. But I wanted something from that, that Kalamazoo, you know, shop. Um, you know, that, that, that classic kind of golden age of, of Gibson guitars. Um, so this one fit the bill. Yeah, it just it plays great. It sounds great. And I actually um, use it to record some, some gargoyle stuff. Oh, really? Probably like maybe clean tones? Exactly, yeah. So I use that on the, uh, I, I use this for most of my clean stuff on the, on the gargoyle record. Cool. Well, mind uh, showing us what it can do, how it sounds? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll play a little blues. So like in a given setting, I know that different situations call for different pickup selection, but typically for what you do and for what you like about this guitar, is there a sweet spot between the, the three way? Uh, so, you know, for me, I think it's like, you know, a lot of my jazz training, but I always just love, uh, you know, the neck pickup on a guitar like this. So uh, what I was just uh, playing there, I've got it, uh, you know, all the way turned up and I've got my tone around like five on this guitar. Um, certain amps, like, they're a little bit brighter, um, you know, for, for revocation, like, I'll usually, like, have my clean channel on the EVH, uh, you know, set to, like, I'll, I'll have the highs up a little bit and the, and the mids up and then, like, the, the, the low, like, right at, like, noon. Um, so, yeah, like, I like to kind of control the warmth of the guitar like more from the tone knob here rather than like on the amp. But, you know, there's definitely guys that do it like the other way around where they'll, you know, they'll, they'll control the tone on the, on the amp and have the tone all the way up. Uh, I think it's just like a matter of, of preference. But since I'm using the, you know, my, my amps in a variety of different settings and like, you know, I want like more of like a metal, like rock tone, um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of like leave my amp where I want it and then kind of get the sound more like out of the guitar. Now, before we uh, move on to more gear, which will be the amp next, which is funny that we're hearing this 335, which sounds wonderful through the EVH, which speaks to its versatility, is I want to ask, uh, because you incorporate all of your influences on everything you do, is there an intentional step to do that? Or when you bring in your jazz stuff into revocation, is it, is it just kind of that's just who you are and that's, you know, kind of just who you become as a player? Yeah, I think, you know, you, you want to make sure that, like, the influences that you have, like, fully sort of filter through yourself as a musician, as an artist. So, uh, you know, I might be listening to Death Metal one day and, you know, John Coltrane the next or in the, in the same day. Um, you know, I get so much inspiration out of all different types of music, and I kind of just like to be a sponge for it and, like, let it kind of soak in. I can, I can sit there and listen to music 
you know, as a musician and, and sort of like analyze it, uh, you know, as it's going through. Uh, or, you know, I can be sort of more of like a passive listener and, and, and not really think about any of like the intricacies of what's happening in the music and just enjoy it for the sake of it being beautiful music that's timeless that, you know, anyone could enjoy. Uh, and I think, you know, and having both sides of that, um, you know, allows me to be like, I don't know, just sort of a vessel for my, for my influences and uh, allows them to kind of seep in in both a, you know, conscious and in a subconscious way. Um, but for me, as far as like when I'm like writing music, I, I try to turn off the conscious part of my brain and just kind of activate that, that subconscious. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily thinking about like you know, modes or, or, or chords or this or that when I'm, when I'm riffing, it's more just like, okay, I'm going for a particular sound. And in the back of my mind, I know sort of the theory that can lead me to that, you know, that sound that I'm going for to those answers. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I just try to like set a mood first and foremost. And then if I need to, I can go back and, and analyze it, you know, and like, let's say I'm writing a solo over something. I can go in and say, okay, these are the chords and these are the scales and arpeggios that fit with those chords and then kind of sort of reverse engineer it that way. Um, but yeah, when I'm writing music, I just try to, I just try to write. Cool, man. Well, uh, uh, let's get back to business at hand and that's talking gear. Uh, let's talk about the EVH behind you. I know that you've been a long time user of that. Uh, you can go ahead and oh, yeah. get the warrior back out for that. Sure. All right, you got the warrior back on. We're about to talk amps, and uh, I, I skipped some things. We need to talk about strings, both for the warrior and um, the 335. What do you use? Sure. Yeah, I use uh, Diodario strings. Uh, on the warrior, I'm doing like 10 to 52, so light top, heavy bottom, and then a low 62. And then on the uh, 335, I actually had Diodario make me like a custom gauge. So I think it's like 49 through 10 or something like that. Um, it's got an unwound G string. Um, I might change that up, but you know, it's, it's feeling good to me. The 10 to 52s I've had forever for the, for like my more metal and rock guitars. Um, you know, I like the kind of beefier low end and then, you know, the, the, the little bit lighter gauge on top, you know, that allows for like you know, bending and whatnot. But yeah, Diodario, they're an awesome company. Um, I just put a fresh set on these guys, uh, recently, or at least on, on this warrior here. Um, and they're always reliable and they're super quick with like shipping and stuff like that. So if I need to put in like a big order for tour you know, I've got like a box of strings, it's going to last me the whole thing in like a couple of days. So that's really what's important is making sure I've got a company that, um, you know, it's just like good to work with when it comes to like ordering supplies and for the studio or for on tour. Right on. And for revocation or gargoyle with the warrior, what, what tunings are you using? Sure. So uh, with, with Revo, we're using, uh, you know, seven strings tuned down a half step. So B flat standard. Uh, and then Gargoyle is just E standard oh, okay. uh, with, with uh, you know, just six strings. OK, uh, so let's move on to the amp, the EVH. Uh, I've, I've, you know, you've been a long user of that 5153. So talk to me about that relationship with EVH and kind of your, your progression with that, that uh, company and the amp. Sure. Uh, yeah, EVH, I mean, they're a great company to work with. Um, you know, my, my rep that's at EVH is my same rep for Jackson, so it's nice to kind of keep it all in the family. Um, I was using a VHT Pitbull before that, also a great amp, but, uh, you know, again, I was l looking for something that uh, I could take on the road that would be reliable and that I would have, like, really good, you know, customer, su customer support with. And, you know, the fact that my Jackson rep is my EVH rep, you know, it just, it just made sense. And um, that being said, you know, I wouldn't play anything if I didn't love the sound of it, right? So, you know, I'm not just trying to play something because, like, I can get, like, an endorsement. Like, I, ha I have to really get behind the product. And the EVH amps, I mean, I think they just sound amazing. They've got, like, an awesome high-gain channel. It, it's, it can get super saturated if you want. I mean, I've got my gain on... Um, like 11 o'clock, I think for like my heavy stuff and it's more gain than I need. Sometimes I'll juice it up to, to 12. Um, but, uh, you know, we're you know, halfway through midnight, right? If we're thinking about a clock face, um, I don't know. I just, I just love the sound of the, uh, of, of the red channel. That's like my primarily like, like go to channel for, um, anything involving like riffs or solos, anything of that nature. And with the, with the 335, you know, you heard the, uh, the clean channel there. I mean, it's just like a killer sounding clean channel. Sometimes high gain amps, 
you know, like they kind of do one thing and they do it well. And then like the clean channel is just sort of like an afterthought. Like it's, it's nice that, you know, the EVH has that like almost like, you know, Fender style clean where it's like it's bright, it's chimey. It could also be like warm uh, if you want it to be with just, you know, tweaking the tone on the guitar or on the amp. Yeah, they're just really versatile, and I think they work great for everything from metal to rock to, you know, even even jazz. What, uh, I know that there's two variations, uh, well, there's two two to variations. They have either the 6L6 and the EL34 version, and then they have the 50 watt and the 100 watt. What are you currently using behind you? Sure, so this guy, you can see the little, little guy there. That's the 50 watt uh, version of the head. I mean, it's got tons of juice. I'll, I'll take the 100 watts out on tour, but I've actually used this on tour as well, and you know, I, I, I'm never maxed out for volume. It's always got more volume than I need, especially when you're running like full stacks and stuff. So um, killer amp, super small. It's like a little bite-sized head that you can just like take around. Uh, this is the EL34. The 6L6 version of the head is, is amazing. Um, I, I have both. I like to kind of go back and forth. I feel like the EL34, both work for, for metal really well. Um, I think maybe like the EL34 has a little bit more of like a like modern rock sound to it. So I've been using more of the EL34 with, with Gargoyle mm. and more like the 6L6 version with, with Revocation. Gotcha. Well, uh, I think that pretty much covers it. You got, uh, so you got uh, a matching 2x12 behind you. Anything special about that, speaker-wise, or is that stock? Uh, that's all stock, yeah. I mean, I just plugged in, played, love the sound of it. Haven't really felt a need to change. Cool. Well, let's dive into your pedal board, and I think even if it's not first in line, I think it's worth starting with your uh, signature Dunnable Eidolon pedal. You, sure, you, yeah. You want to talk about like how that got developed <coughs> with Sasha and Damnation Audio because it's kind of a unique concept. For sure. I had this idea to do a, like an all-in-one lead pedal uh, a little while ago. Uh, it just kind of came to me on tour, you know, traveling, having to set up multiple pedals in an effects loop. You know, when you're, when you're on tour, I mean, if you're, if you're headlining, you've got like time to sound check. But, you know, if you're, if you're on like an opening slot of a tour, you kind of have to be on and off stage like super quick, right? Because everything's running on a tight schedule. So I was looking for something that was going to sound great, but also like streamline my setup. And initially I had this idea because I thought someone like already made this pedal. Um, you know, I wanted something that was a boost, a reverb and a delay all in one. Now, you know, you could probably get that through like different sort of multi effects units, but I just wanted like a simple like stomp box. And I just like couldn't for the life of me, like find it anywhere. So I'm buddies with, with Sasha, uh, you know, Intronauts, an incredible band. And he's been making guitars for a while now and just like been knocking out of the park with that. So uh, I reached out to him. He loved the idea. And then we just kind of got work on, uh, on some prototypes. Like I, I spent a long time, like really dialing in, you know, both the reverb sound, you know, the boost, making sure it was like uncolored. It just kind of takes the sound that you love and, and just juices it up a bit. Uh, and then the delay, it gives you like that nice kind of, you know, digital delay, but like you can throw a mod switch on there and get like more of like a, um, you know, almost like a tape delay, like little like chorusy sort of warble on the ch on the trails of the delay. So it's got like a ton of different uh, ways you can dial in your sound. And what's cool is like every single effect on there, you know, is is its own unit. So like you don't have to have reverb and delay together. Like if, if you only like a reverb sound, you can just have the reverb. If you only like your delays or lead sound to have delay, you can just use the delay and then they can be independent of each other. Um, and then, and then the boost works independently, um, as well. So it's got, it's got a boost knob, a color knob that affects, um, you know, the sound of the reverb, um, reverb knob, time feedback and, and delay. Uh, on the bottom, so those are all like the uh, the, the delay based effects, and then that that really cool mod switch. Uh, I know that we're gonna I'm gonna use a buzzword. I know that it sounds like you have a, a transparent boost. It sounds like a digital delay. Is there anything specific about the reverb? Is it a hall? Is it a plate? Kind of what what where's it laying there? Yeah, it's it's more like that '80s hall sound um, that that I love. Um, I've got like a couple different reverb pedals that I was like trying out and, and, and listening to, uh, you know, to really dial this, uh, dial this sound in. And yeah, we, we settled on that hall sound. I think it's great for, 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 you know, metal leads for rock leads. Uh, but it's also really good for, for, uh, you know, clean channel, just like jazzy reverb, uh, as well. So, but I mean, I'm primarily using it in my effects loop with, with revocation and uh, that way the effects are, 
you know, they're more kind of baked into the cake, like a little bit more subtle. They're not as like in your face if you were using it like out in front of the amp, but you could use it both ways um, and, you know, get like totally different sounds. Well, I was literally going to ask you why you use it in the effects loop before we hear it. You answered that question. So let's, let's hear how you use the pedal uh, actual, you know, in application. Now, is that a pedal you use just for solos? I know that the 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 didn't I guess the the impetus was for solos, but is it something that you use beyond that, or how do you use it? Yeah, um, you know, I'll use it for clean stuff sometimes uh, live. Like, there's a part in a song called Madness Opus uh, that I'll I'll throw that on to give some like just extra kind of foreboding atmosphere. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll show you like how it would sound like in a, a clean application. So for, you know, it definitely, you know, has three effects in it. So it, it's on its surface, it's a versatile pedal, but obviously the way you're using it, 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 it kind of backs that up. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I wanted something that I could use in a lot of different applications that would be super easy to dial in um, and, and, and sound great. And I think, uh, you know, the, the team at, at Dunnable just really, I mean, they, they matched my expectations and then exceeded them. That's awesome. Uh, well, let's move on to what else you have on your pedal board. Sure. So, you know, I've got the classic uh, Polytune, uh, the little mini. Um, it's a great tuner, and it takes up a small footprint on the board. Uh, I've got the, the Zool, the Fortin Zool, for, uh, you know, noise gate purposes, right? So if I'm playing something that I need to really, like, stop on a dime, that, uh, that Zool works fantastic. Um, then I've got my... Strymon Mobius, which is a really special pedal. Uh, it's got like all these different effects in one. Um, you know, it's got like a bit crusher, it's got a phaser, chorus, um, anything that, you know, gives you these like weird sort of warbly uh, sounds uh, that that pedal is uh, really great for. What do you use it for? Is there any like specific application maybe people can think of, uh, you know, whether it's through your discography or just anything that you, you know, jam on? Yeah, it's it's me. It's more just like about like jamming on different stuff. You know, it's it's about like using the pedal as a sound source, using the pedal as you know a, a, a way to just kind of inspire uh, new ideas. Um, but yeah, it's, it sounds really killer. So this might be more of a quarantine teaching pedal board than revocation. Correct. Yeah, this is more on my like home inspiration like teaching rig. Cool. Is there, it, it, could you show us maybe your favorite Mobius setting? Sure, sure. Um, I'll actually combine this with another pedal that I really like. I've, I've got a, a J Rocket Animal on here, which is kind of like a modded Marshall kind of style-like sound pedal. Okay. Um, so it's got like crunch, but it's not like screaming gain. So I kind of like to dial in the phaser setting on this pedal and then run the, uh, the Animal with it as well. I think it's got some really uh, cool sounds, so... Man, that sounds great. It's it's like Eddie Hazel joined a metal band. Like it's funky, but it's also like heavy, especially when you go down those low notes. Yeah, you know the, the, that's the fun you can have with that uh, that seven string and uh, a little bit of phase. <laughs> that rules. What's up? What else besides? And like, I guess to back up, 
besides just teaming up with the Mobius, how else do you use the animal? Uh, you know, the, the, the animal I'll use just, just to kind of like add a little bit of like juice to my playing here and there. Like it's kind of a cool pedal that works uh, with a lot of the pedals uh, on, my, on my board, especially for like my, my teaching setup. So, um, you know, I'll also use it with like my freeze pedal. Um, the, the, the freeze pedal is actually like a really cool tool. I mean, I haven't really used it live much, although it would be cool to, to incorporate it. Um, but I'll use it a lot for like teaching. So, you know, I'll, I'll basically freeze like a, like a clean sound on the, on the freeze pedal and then like maybe like sort of solo over that sound, uh, you know, using the animal just to kind of like, you know, cut through the, uh, the, you know, that, that drone of, of, the, of the freeze pedal sound. Um, so I can, I can showcase that. Now yeah, I was going to say, don't, I don't want to put you in the spot, but let, let's hear that. So I can kind of showcase the sound of like, you know, a particular mode and how it'll fit over, you know, a particular chord. Right on, man. And I kind of noticed towards the end of the plane there that you, 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 you kind of leaned against the Floyd Rose. I don't see a bar there, but you do use the Floyd Rose since I didn't bring it up while we're talking about the guitar. You use it, you know, quite a bit to, to express and to add some vocabulary, you know, whether it's numbing agents or alters or sacrifice. It's, it's definitely a, a, a thing you use. It's not just there for looks. Oh yeah, for sure. I definitely uh, use and abuse the whammy <laughs> bar for sure. But that's all. That's all good fun and metal. You can do that. Of course. <laughs> yeah, you can get super, super weird with it. What about um, like dynamics that are within the band, whether it's Revocation or Gargoyle? Because there are still, you know, it's death metal with that with Revo, but there is still the dynamic flow of a song, an album. So how are you manipulating that? Is it on the guitar or are you using a volume pedal? Uh, yeah, I don't really use a volume pedal with, with Revocation. Um, I have one that I'll, I'll, I'll mess around with a little bit like with like, um, you know, more like jazz settings. Um, but yeah, you know, pretty much it's all just controlled by the, uh, the volume knob on the guitar if I'm doing that kind of thing. Um, although I, I will say like, I kind of have my settings dialed in how I how I want to have them dialed in. So like, unless I'm using like an amp that like the foot switch is like kind of like weird on or whatever, or like you know I have to do like a fly-in gig where I don't have like my first choice of backline and like the, the amp doesn't have a, a foot switch, which like, happens sometimes. That's when I'll kind of start to control things a little bit more from the from the volume now when it comes to clean stuff. But uh, with revocation, if, if if we've got our backline out with us. You know, I already kind of have like the, the clean green channel dialed in to, to where I want it, where it's maybe like a little bit lower in volume, uh, you know, obviously like, you know, no gain on it. Like if I'm doing more of those atmospheric style parts uh, and then I can kick back into like the to the red channel and, um, you know, get that super heavy the channel boost and like the channel switching probably helps, too, with like the immediacy of of those tempo changes. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I always, I always have my my pedal board, and then like, uh, on my on my home rig, I, I don't have the the foot switch actually on the pedal board itself. But uh, a lot of times, like on my like flying pedal board, if I'm doing like gigs like overseas, or even if I'm uh, you know going out on tour for an extended tour with Revocation, I'll have my my um, uh, you know foot switcher like right on my pedal board as well, so it's all like one unit. Gotcha. Well, after the animal and the freeze, is there anything else uh, on your pedal board? Yeah, the very last pedal on here is my Ditto Looper. Um, I love this pedal. This is another great pedal for teaching uh, or also just for like, you know, inspiration, like finding different sounds. Um, it's, it's something you can just spend like hours and hours uh, playing around with. I just have like the simple, small little uh, footprint version of it. I mean, they make different kinds mm -hmm. now, but I've got like one of the older ones where it's just super simple. It's, it's one knob. It's, you know, it's one button and you can just kind of keep adding layers onto onto loops do you use it more as an instructional thing or is it more as a, a like a idea grabber 
or idea spur. It's 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 really both with that one. Yeah, um, I'll 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 use it, you know, to 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 teach. You know, if I'm playing over progression, but but really I like to use it to you know just for myself to sort of find sounds, create like a vamp, and just like keep layering, you know, ideas over top of, and you know, seeing what I can come up with. Right on, man. Well, I appreciate you talking to us about the gear. It's awesome to hear you explain uh, from your own perspective the signature stuff you got and kind of what you put into it. If people want to track down, uh, obviously you mentioned Gargoyle stuff will be out in October. Uh, again, about your website for lessons and other information, where should they check that stuff out at? Sure, yeah. So my website's uh, davedavidsonguitar.com. Uh, and then uh, Revocation, you know, you can find us online. Uh, you know, we're on all the different streaming sites. Uh, and, you, you know, you can pick up, uh, you know, merch online if you, if you search for it. Uh, and then with Gargoyle, uh, the new record's coming out October 9th through Season of Mist Records. You can pick it up, um, you know, on Bandcamp or through the Season of Mist website. And, uh, yeah, we, uh, we just released uh, our first single, Electrical Sickness, uh, and I'm not sure when this is going to air, but, uh, you know, our second signal, uh, Wraith, is coming out uh, very soon. So be on the lookout for that and you know, pre-order that record. Uh, as this will exist as long as the Internet does, if people want to maybe <laughs> check out things that you may be doing in the near future behind that album releases, do you guys have anything in the works like uh, streaming or live shows and live driving? I don't know. Anything got cooking? We're, we're kind of all scattered right now. Like two of the members are in Canada. Um, but we're, we're definitely talking about ways to, to promote it since we won't be able to tour, unfortunately, for quite some time. So, yeah, we're definitely talking about maybe doing some, some pre-recorded, like, sort of home concert where we each kind of play our own part and maybe edit it together. So there's definitely some ways uh, we can get together for, for some kind of live, quote-unquote, uh, you know, through the Internet style show. So... Hey, it's, we did uh, it. If we did it just now with the rig rundown, you can do it. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. So it's it's 2020. Uh, you just got to get creative with uh, you know how you can get your your music out there for people because I think people definitely, you know, we need music now more than ever. I think. Absolutely, man. Uh, again, Dave, I appreciate the time hanging out with me and talking gear. Hope you're being well and staying safe, just like everyone else on the internet. Uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks so much, man. Appreciate it. Killer.